Thank you for listening to our church podcast, where it is our joy to share helpful truths from the Bible. We pray this serves as one more tool to help develop leaders within our church and community who love and honor Jesus and reveal it by loving others. If you have any questions or comments about any of the messages, we invite you to join us on any Wednesday, 6 p.m., for a group discussion on the passages and sermons found here. Scripture reading today will be from Luke chapter 14. Reading verses 1 through 14, I ask that you stand as we read. Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of the ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully, and behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, is it not uh, I'm sorry is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day or not but they remained silent then he took him and healed him and sent him away and he said to them which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out and they could not reply to these things now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor saying to them When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he might say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the reading of your word. Instruct us and guide us in your ways today. Help our eyes to be enlightened, to receive the truth that you have for us in this text, and help us to apply it to our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, Today we're going to bash religious people, which might sound a little bit weird considering we're doing this in church. Uh, But if you've been here for a while, you're used to this, because I regularly criticize religion and the fake hypocrisy, uh, the tendencies that tend to come along with it. I do so on purpose because Jesus did so. Uh, Throughout his life and teaching ministry, no one drew more criticism from Jesus than the religious crowd, in particular the Pharisees. These were the most strict, pious people in Israel. The Pharisees were careful observers of the Old Testament laws, and they had even added a few of their own. There were 611 laws in the Old Testament. The Pharisees had added hundreds and thousands of them uh, in addition to that. The Pharisees were the religious fundamentalists of their day. And because of their ostensibly religious lifestyles, they were highly esteemed. Uh, The Jews looked to the Pharisees as their spiritual leaders, Jesus came along and disrupted all of that. He he called out their hypocrisy, he contradicted much of their teachings, and he taught a whole new way of approaching God. The Pharisees thought that you pleased God by following all the rules, but Jesus taught that the heart was the issue. If you followed all the rules on paper, but you were, you were an uncaring, unloving jerk, uh, that hardly ma- makes you right with God. But if you love God with all your heart and you love others as yourself, living according to the commands of the Bible is then a result of that love of God in your heart. It flows out of the proper motives instead of being a source of pride and hypocrisy. This is why Jesus was always getting down to the core of things, to the root, instead of just dealing with the outward laws. The Pharisees, for example, said uh, it's wrong to, to murder. Jesus said not only that, but it's wrong to hate. He said if Even if you never actually commit murder, if you hate someone in your heart, you've already sinned. The Pharisees said it's wrong to commit adultery, and Jesus said not only that, but it's 
wrong to lust after someone you're not married to. Even if you never commit that act, if you've fantasized in your heart, you've already sinned. Jesus was always pressing people to not just focus on keeping the outward rules, but to have their hearts right as well. And so today's text is yet another instance where Jesus criticizes the Pharisees. Uh, You could title today's sermon, Jesus Crashes Another Dinner Party, because this is the third time so far in Luke's gospel where Jesus has been invited to a Pharisee's house and things turn south very quickly. Now, the uh, first story in our text is a familiar one. Someone is healed by Christ on the Sabbath day. The Pharisees are not happy about it, and Jesus rebukes their Uh, their heartlessness and their selfishness. It's familiar to us because it it happens multiple times in Luke, including a text we studied just a few weeks ago in Luke chapter 13. You remember the woman in the synagogue who was bent over and she couldn't straighten herself. Uh, Jesus healed her on the Sabbath day and the religious guys went crazy uh, because you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day. Uh, This account in Luke 14 is an entirely different story with a different person being healed And yet the conversation and the point of the passage is identical. Jesus even uses the same illustration of pulling an ox up on the Sabbath uh, to to show their hypocrisy and their heartlessness towards, towards people in need. And so this might lead us to ask, why did Luke include this twice in his gospel? I mean, I mean, we got the point last time in chapter 13. Why would you put another story in the gospel of Luke that is basically the same thing all over again? And I think repetition in Scripture is there for a reason. The things that are mentioned multiple times should draw our attention. And in this case, I think the reason these encounters with the Pharisees keep popping up throughout the book of Luke is to show us that these are common religious pitfalls. Uh, The things that Jesus rebukes the Pharisees for are the same tendencies we should watch out for in our own lives. And so rather than to just think, well, I I already got the point of the story in chapter 13, I don't need to pay attention to this one, uh, we ought to instead pay even more attention simply because of the fact that God chose us to give the same story with the same point multiple times. He's trying to show us that these tendencies toward hypocrisy and a lack of love for others is a common problem with religious people. I think it's also true of those of us who are genuinely trying to please the Lord with our lives. It's so easy for us to start out with pure motives. And then eventually we end up just doing all of our little religious duties with no heart behind them at all. And so let's look now at the verses starting in Luke 14. And let's ask ourselves as we go here, what is God trying to teach us about ourselves? Instead of just automatically siding with Jesus and saying, oh, get them, Jesus, you know, rebuke those Pharisees. Uh, let's ask Maybe today, in what ways am I like these Pharisees? In what ways is Jesus rebuking my heart? So we'll pick up the story, starting in verse 1. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. The Pharisees were always watching Jesus carefully, weren't they? They were always looking for him to slip up, to say or to do something that they could then pounce on. And here we learn the first lesson right here in the first verse. Religious people have a tendency to overly scrutinize others. We look down our judgmental noses at others to see if they're living up to our standards. By the way, this really comes out in social media. Uh, You post something on Facebook and the religious people are immediately looking in the background of the picture for something to criticize. And I won't give examples because it's just depressing, but believe me, it happens. Uh, they're asking, well, where are they? And what's that? Oh, what are they drinking? And they're, they're looking and analyzing all of these little details, trying to scrutinize and see if there are sins or weaknesses. Religious people are quick to notice areas of weakness in others, but not so careful to inspect their own lives. This is what Jesus referred to as pulling the speck out of your brother's eye when you have a log in your own. We're really good at spotting those little specks in everybody else. We've got 20-20 vision uh, with other people's lives. But with ourselves, we've got a huge blind spot. And so religious people tend to overly scrutinize others. Back to our text, you notice when you first read this, it should jump off at you that a ruler of the Pharisees is inviting Jesus over for a meal. This is very strange. Uh, At this point in Jesus' ministry, he's made quite clear what he thought of the Pharisees and their false teachings. And the Pharisees hated Jesus for it. They saw him as a threat to their religious position of power over the people. At this point, they were already trying to kill Jesus. So why would a Pharisee invite Jesus over for a meal? Uh, 
Well, we get a clue there in those words at the end of the verse where it says they were watching him carefully. This was a trap. They had invited Jesus over in order to get him to break the Sabbath. The very same word there for watching is used in Mark 3, verse 2, where it says they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. They were watching him like a hawk on its prey. The Pharisees, they did this all the time, uh, watching Jesus intently to see if they could find some way to accuse him of doing something wrong. And here in our text in verse 14, they invite Jesus over for dinner just to see if they can get him to heal on the Sabbath and trap him, which leads us to our next point. Religious people often have a tendency <clears throat> to be fake. In this case, they invite you over for a meal so they can trap you and shame you. Now, maybe we don't go that far, but we still have our fake tendencies, don't we? Like when we say, uh, praying for you, are you really? It's a common phrase in church culture, right? We say, oh, I'm praying for you, brother. Is that really true? Or we act spiritual here at church on Sundays, and then we're a completely different person at work on Monday. We make sure we have our Bible in hand for church, but then we don't open it the rest of the week. We're really good at putting on a show for each other, aren't we? Religious people have a tendency to be fake. And so the trap is set. Jesus is in the Pharisee's house on the Sabbath day, and they're watching him like a hawk. And verse 2 says, Behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. Now, dropsy is uh, more of a symptom than a disease. It just means a, a bloating of the skin that would be a result of some sort of diseased organs inside. We can't be sure exactly what the issue is. It likely was a liver problem or something. Uh, incidentally, this is the only mention of dropsy in the Bible, which is not surprising because Luke, the physician, uses many medical terms throughout the book that are uh, only mentioned there. Verse 3, Jesus responds, responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees. Now, notice... He responds, but they hadn't said anything. Uh, they see the man with dropsy there. It's the Sabbath day. And so he answers their, uh, their silent thoughts here. He responds to them. He knows what they're doing. He knew the Pharisee had invited him over as a setup. And they were watching him to see how he would respond to this man who was in need of healing. And so he asked the question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And we know from the Pharisee's perspective that it wasn't. Uh, they had all of these different rules they added to the Old Testament. This is another thing we learn about religious people. They tend to add rules to Scripture. The Old Testament simply says, don't work on the Sabbath day. That was the command. And God, and, and, uh, God gave certain restrictions in the Old Testament about things you could do on the Sabbath. But the Pharisees were not content with that sort of ambiguity. And so they added a bunch of rules and regulations about what was allowed and what wasn't allowed on the Sabbath day. None of it from God. All of it man-made. And if we're not careful, we tend to do the same things. We come up with unwritten rules that are simply our personal thoughts, not actually backed up by biblical commands. Uh, I've received some such criticisms here in the last year and a half. I don't really tell you people about these things because it's from the outside. Uh, but people criticize us, for example, for not having Sunday night services. Uh, is that anywhere in the Bible? Of course not. Uh, it's simply an American tradition. A lot of Baptist churches... Uh, have Sunday morning services, and then they go for lunch or something, and then they come back in the evenings and have a Sunday night service. And let me be clear, I do not think it's wrong for churches to do that. It's perfectly fine. Go for it. But it's not a biblical command that you meet twice on Sundays. And so just because something is traditional, that doesn't mean it's binding on everybody else like commands of the Bible are. Uh, some people have criticized our church for having drums in our music. Uh, again, nowhere in the Bible does is there a list of instruments that are acceptable and a list that aren't acceptable? It's just man-made traditions. But this is, this is what religious people do. Uh, it's not new. Religious people in Jesus' day had their own set of rules and traditions, and they expected everybody else to abide by their rules or else they would criticize them. Let's not be so small-minded about Christianity. There are godly people all over the world who love and serve Jesus, and they do things differently than we do. And if you attend their churches, you may notice differences, some of which you might think, oh, that's a little bit weird. Uh, maybe I wouldn't do it that way. But we don't make the rules. God does. We submit to what the Bible teaches, and we allow freedom for different methods and different traditions where the Bible gives us no clear instructions. So Jesus asks the Pharisees, if it's lawful to heal on the Sabbath, he sees the trap they've set. Uh, in their opinion, by the way, in the Talmud, it says basically a doctor, you can't even uh, help someone on the Sabbath unless it's life-threatening. 
Unless they're going to die, you're not allowed to get assistance. They have to wait until the next day. That was their man-made rule that they had come up with. And so verse 4, Jesus asked this question, and they remained silent. They had nothing to say. They didn't, uh, they didn't want to answer him directly. And so he takes the man, he heals him, and sends him away. Verse 5, he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on the Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Jesus said something very similar in the previous chapter, you may remember. But it was a different audience, likely, as he was moving from town to town. Notice Jesus really doesn't get into the finer points of the law and debate if healing was acceptable or if it was considered work on the Sabbath. Rather, he points out their lack of love. He says, if, if your son fell into a well, or if even if your animal fell into a well, you would immediately help him out, even if it was the Sabbath day. And so the only reason that they had a problem with Jesus healing this man on the Sabbath was simple. They didn't care about the man. Something tells me if this ruler of the Pharisees was the one with the disease, he wouldn't be so legalistic about Sabbath observance. Religious people tend to lack love for others. In other words, they miss the whole point of Christianity. Uh, what's the most important commands in the whole Bible? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with everything you have. And secondly, love others as yourself. Those are the two most important commands in Scripture, according to Jesus. You miss those two, and it really doesn't matter how often you go to church or how carefully you keep the Sabbath. Totally irrelevant if you don't have a heart of love. I've brought this verse to your attention before, but I can't resist referring to it again. Matthew 23, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. Now, this is how religious people tend to be. We're careful to tithe on all of our money, but we neglect the more important matters like mercy. We're nitpicky about little stuff and we ignore the big stuff. How do we get a, a sense of proportion? I think it really starts with believing what Jesus said, that there are the two most important commands, love God and love others. And if you really get those two, a lot of the other rules tend to fall into place. Verse 7, Jesus points out another negative tendency of religious people. He told a parable to those who were invited, the other people who were there for the feast, when he noticed how they chose the places of honor. Uh, the meal at the ruler of the Pharisee's house was apparently a big ordeal. This wasn't a normal uh, lunch or something. There was a lot of people invited here. This was a feast. Many people had been invited aside from Jesus. And as they were walking in and sitting down at the table for this meal, Jesus is watching them. You ever go people watching? Uh, if you're ever bored sometime, go in a public place and just watch people. It's really interesting. And so Jesus is doing this. He's watching these people as they're coming in for the feast. And he notices how they're choosing their places to sit. They chose the places of honor, which generally would be the seats closest to the host of the dinner, because religious people tend to exalt themselves in the eyes of others. They want to be well thought of. Jesus says in verse 8, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. That would be really awkward, wouldn't it? You go to sit down right next to the host, uh, thinking you're uh, really important at this meal, and the host says, actually, sport, scoot down a few spots. There's somebody more important than you here. Uh, you would be humiliated. Now, this isn't a, a perfect illustration, but it sort of gets at the point. I, I grew up in uh, the northeast corner of New York State, about an hour south of Montreal, Canada. And when I was a kid, there was a Major League Baseball team there in Montreal called the Expos. They don't ex exist anymore, by the way, because they were terrible. Uh, one of the worst teams in the MLB. They always lost, and so eventually they just folded up. Uh, but it was still a Major League Baseball team. It was within an hour of where I lived, and so... Uh, my brother and I and my dad would go up regularly uh, to watch the games. And the Expos were so bad that the stadium was almost completely empty. Uh, there would be a few people down at the, at the bottom part of it, but most of the stadium would be empty. And so what my dad would do is he would get the tickets for the cheap seats uh, way up in the, the nosebleed section of the stadium where you can hardly see anything. And then once we got there, we would just walk down closer to the field and get a closer spot. 
Now, a couple of times it happened that we would choose those empty seats closer to the field, and then somebody would show up with their tickets in hand, and we'd be informed we were in their spot. And then we'd have to do the walk of shame back up higher, and everybody knew exactly what we had done. Uh, Now, again, I say it's not the perfect illustration, because in our case, we were choosing those better seats in order to see the game better. While the Pharisees here, they were choosing the honored seats in order to impress people at the dinner. But you can see how embarrassing it would be to have to move down to a lower seat and be humiliated. And so Jesus continues in verse 10, But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, the point of this isn't a strategy to be exalted in the eyes of men. Jesus is not suggesting that you sit in the lower seat, and while you're sitting there, you're thinking to yourself, I really belong up there. That's not true humility. Humility is choosing the lower seat because you actually think you deserve it. God exalts those who are truly humble, who don't think of themselves as being better than everybody else. Because isn't that the point? If you picked the most honored seat at the feast, what are you saying? I'm more important than everybody else here. Jesus said in another place about the Pharisees, Matthew 23, they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. What a radically different attitude Jesus had in the religious people. They wanted to exalt themselves in the eyes of those around them. They wanted everybody to refer to them as rabbi. They wanted to sit in the honored places in the synagogues and at feasts. Jesus says, forget what everybody else thinks of you and instead focus on what God thinks. And the greatest person in God's eyes is the servant, the one who humbles himself, who doesn't think that he's all that, but instead seeks to serve others. That's the guy that's impressive to God, and God will honor him. You want to be the greatest? Become a servant. Look for ways to serve others. Go hang out with the outcasts of society like Jesus did and befriend them. Religious people tend to exalt themselves in the eyes of others. Uh, Last point, religious people tend to ignore Those who have nothing to offer them. Verse 12, Jesus says also to the man who had invited him. So he was just talking to the guests who were there, trying to get close to the host. Now he turns his attention to the host of the the feast. And he says to him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now, this is maybe something you've not thought of before, but who do you really do nice things for? I want you all to think. A family aside, who are your friends? Who do you go out of your way to do good for? Many of us, if we're honest, the people that we choose to be friends to are those who have something to offer us. They lend us something, and then we lend them something. We take them out for a meal, they take us out for a meal. We tend to subconsciously seek out reciprocal friendships. And Jesus is saying something radical in these verses. If you really want to demonstrate true love for others, do something for someone who has nothing to offer you. Friendships should not have social limits. You ought, not have, or you ought to have friends of lower status than yourself. You ought to treat them just as you would treat an honored guest. And so he says, if you're going to have a feast, invite some poor disabled people who can offer you nothing. Uh, Be a blessing to those who can't bless you back. Do good to someone where you'll get zero recognition for it. No one will ever even know that you bought that person a meal, you served him in some way. If you're only willing to be a blessing to people who can repay you, you're not really loving them, you're using them. True Christian love is when you generously serve others with no selfish motive for recognition or reciprocation. That's what greatness in God's kingdom looks like. James taught this principle of love 
uh, without regard for one's social status. We'll start in the last verse of chapter 1. We'll read into chapter 2. Remember, uh, chapter divisions are not uh, original. Those weren't in the original writings of the letters of the New Testament. Those were added hundreds of years later. And so this is all one letter. We're going to start at the end of verse 27, which says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. He says, if you really want to be pure in your religion, go bless some orphans and widows. Go do something for somebody who can offer you nothing. Show them the love of Christ. The next verse, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, which would be the church, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you? And the ones who drag you into court, and are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And so James says if, if two people come into our church, one dressed fancily, one that's clearly a rich person, and then a poor person comes in behind him, they ought to be treated with the same dignity and respect. If someone walks in this church, they should be loved and accepted and embraced by every person in this room, regardless of who they are, what they're wearing, what their social status is. The church is to be a place where anyone can come and feel loved. I want to go back to one last point from our text in Luke verse 14. Jesus said, do good to those who are social outcasts because they can't repay you. Notice the reason at the end of the verse. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. The fact that you have a future life after death is supposed to change the way you live. If there were no life after death, if there was no resurrection, it would make sense to seek only reciprocal relationships. If this life is all there is, it would seem wise to seek your own interests and only befriend those who can benefit your life. But if there's a resurrection and if there's a judgment coming, that reality should have an effect on your choices. Do we make decisions based upon how they'll benefit us in this life? Or do we spend ourselves in the service of others in such a way that can only be explained if there's life after death? Why on earth would you invite poor and crippled and blind people to come over for a feast? Jesus says, do this because although they can't repay you, God will. Whatever money, time, energy you spend in service to others, God promises he will repay it back to you in eternity. I don't know all of what that means. I don't quite uh, understand the economy in heaven. But I do see in Scripture that heaven will be better for some than others. The Bible is clear about that. Some will be rewarded more than others. And so however all of that works, Jesus says we will be repaid in eternity for our acts of love to others. Let that drive you to find someone to bless who can do nothing for you in return. We've seen six tendencies religious people have, six pitfalls that we need to be aware of, and we need to watch out for our own lives. And as I review them now, ask yourself, does one of these describe me? Number one, religious people tend to overly scrutinize the lives of others. Religious people tend to be fake. Religious people tend to add rules to Scripture and judge those who don't live by their standards. Religious people tend to lack love for others. Religious people tend to exalt themselves in the eyes of those around them. And religious people tend to ignore those who have nothing to offer them. That's my list. Here's another list from Stephen Cole who said uh, this about religious hypocrites. Number one, they study the Bible for ammunition against others but they don't apply it to themselves. They target and try to bring down anyone who confronts their sin with the Bible. They care more about their man-made rules than about people. They bend the rules for their own purposes, but then apply them rigidly to others. They often ignore overwhelming evidence 
in order to persist in their sin. If we're going to avoid religious hypocrisy, we must allow the Word of God to confront our sins, and we must respond with repentance and obedience, not hardness of heart. We hope the message you just heard was helpful to you. It means a lot to us that you would join us for this podcast. For more information about our church and meeting times, visit lbcmiller.com or call us at 219-885-9303. We would love to hear from you.